I would like us to think how we, or any animal for that matter, can know what objects are in the world around them. And I'd like to start with my greatest inspiration, who happens to be my daughter Grace, and she's here in this audience. Now, Grace, her first word was duck, which is a rather odd first word for a baby to have. But you see, every night she went to sleep with this duck. And this was her first word, and it was this item. Only this object in the entire universe was duck to her. But as she grew, and as she started to learn a bit more about the world around her, she started to understand that objects, many objects, could be called the same word. Many things could be a ball, or a cup, or a duck, for that matter. And at first, she called anything with feathers that walked a duck. So that would include chickens, or geese, or pigeons, or anything that was walking around. But by the time she was about 18 months old, she was able to generate a specific representation of what a duck is, and that it was a separate item from other birds or other animals. Which really begs the question, I mean, well, what is a duck? What does Grace, or you and I, recognize as qualities that are inherently ducky, right, and not another bird or another animal around us? To answer that question, perhaps it's better to start with a more basic question, which is why we even need to identify objects in the world around us at all. If you imagine for a second that you're in a world void of all objects, except for a single object, well, there's no reason to identify that object, because it's the only thing there. You could call it whatever you want, but you really don't have to call it anything at all. The same is true if you have multiple objects in your environment, as long as to you they all mean the same thing. You could take one or take the other, and it doesn't matter. And it doesn't even, you don't even need to discriminate them, because they mean the same to you. But now, if one of those items becomes poisonous, now, now it's extremely important for you to discriminate those objects in your environment. You need to tell them from each other, and you need to be able to identify them, because obviously it might kill you. In this world, Maybe you'd only need to know that it's red. Or maybe you'd only need to know that it's a cube, so you'd avoid all red things or all cuboid things. But of course, the real world that we live in is extremely complex. In the Western Ghats of India, for example, as we see here, there are many things that are red, many things that are round, many things that are square, different colors, different shapes, different sizes, and no single cue actually reliably tells us what things are. That means to identify any object, we have to put multiple cues together, color, shape, size, smell, lots of different qualities of that object. So, how do we do it? Well, if it's you or I, we actually learn about what things are. We learn from our mommies and daddies and relatives when we're young, and we also learn by experiencing the world around us. But what if you don't have mommies and daddies to teach you what things are? Insects, for example, are mostly solitary, meaning that for most species of insects, there is no mommy or daddy there. When they emerge from an egg or they emerge from a pupil case, they're on their own. There is no one there to teach them what things are in their environment. And additionally, most insects only live for a few days or a few weeks so they don't have the time or the energy to spend trying to experiencing everything in their world and find out what is their food and what is their enemy and what, who they need to mate with. So if you're this hoverfly, for example, your main object of interest is a flower, because you feed on nectar and pollen from that flower. And these hoverflies are extremely good at identifying flowers. They are so good, in fact, that they can identify flowers here in tropical Bangalore at high altitudes in the Himalayas and Sikkim. We found them even higher than this at 4,000 meters. In the temperate regions of Central Europe, as well as subarctic Sweden, they are so good at identifying flowers. How do they do it? They're so tiny, tiny little animals. How are they able to identify things in their world? Well, first, what is a flower? I mean, this is a flower. This is an evening primrose, to be precise. And you and I recognize this as a flower. But this also is a flower. 
This is the UV image of that flower. You and I, we detect wavelengths in the visual spectrum. We call them colors. But insects, many of them, can actually detect wavelengths in the ultraviolet range. And many flowers and many plants have specific patterns that only insects can see and we cannot. This is also a flower. This is the humidity gradient coming from a flower. Flowers that have rich in pollen and nectar contain a lot of water, so therefore they are more humid than the surrounding environment. So humidity is a good indicator of where a flower is. And this is also a flower. This is a spectrum of the chemicals that make up the smell of that evening primrose. So all of these different cues are available to these hoverflies to identify what a flower is. So how do they do it? Well, they use their head, of course, just like we do. And to be more precise, they actually use their brain. So here is the brain of a fly. This particular fly brain is about half a millimeter in size. And this is what the brain looks like under the microscope when we have stained the different brain regions with fluorescent dye. So just like the human brain, insect brains also have particular brain regions to process smells and sights and memory. So how do they use these brain regions to identify objects? Well, one way, of course, is by simply adding up the particular cues that you're interested in. So you could say, OK, I've got this color and this smell and this shape and this size, and it's humid, must be a flower. You just add everything up in a sum. But of course, as Grace will tell you, just because something looks like a duck and walks like a duck, it doesn't actually make it always a duck. And this is a very dangerous game to play when you're outside in nature, because sometimes those particular cues won't be available. On a windy day, a flower won't have much smell. You may be in here in Bangalore during monsoon when the humidity is so high you can't tell the difference. So these cues are not always reliable just to add them up like this. Rather, Research in our lab has shown that insects process certain objects, like odors, as a unique representation that is separate from the sum of its parts. So here you can see some live brain imaging that we have done in insects. So while they're living, we are able to image the activity while they're smelling odors. And we can see that actually the input of that activity is very altered by the specialized networks in their brain. So although it comes in in a certain way, it goes out in a very different way. And what that tells us is that the insect brain is specially wired to create a gestalt. A gestalt is a German word meaning the whole that is not the sum of its parts. They create an object in their brain. And because, as I said, many insects are born with the ability to identify certain objects, that means they have specialized networks in their brain to identify things that are important to them. For a hoverfly, that's a flower. For a mosquito, it's you, right? So this is also necessary, because as I also mentioned, just summing things up is not a very reliable way to identify things when you're out there in nature in that crazy mess like the Western Ghats. It's very important that they're able to discriminate objects when certain cues might be obscured or missing. And so that is what allows them to create this gestalt. Now, what if you're experiencing something new, like this blue banana right here? Now, I I've never seen a blue banana in nature, but I do have a gestalt in my own mind of what a banana is, and this does look like a banana. And my gestalt does include color. Now, if this banana was completely black, I probably wouldn't be eating it. But bananas can be different colors. They can be green, they can be yellow, they can have speckles of black in them. So maybe I might be able to think of this as a food source, even though it's blue, which is a little bizarre. Such is the case for this insect. This is the apple fly. And this is native to North America and also where I was born in New York. And this apple fly is very interesting because 400 years ago, there were no apple flies on this planet. Now, these flies existed, of course, but the apples did not, at least not in North America. Now, apples were introduced to North America by the colonists as they came to the New World, and they were planting apples as a food source. So, until this time, 400 years ago, 
these flies were surviving on a different fruit. In fact, they were surviving on tiny red berries that grow from a hawthorn tree. So how did the apple fly come about? Well, as I've said, they, like many other insects, were born with an innate or inborn a way to identify hawthorn berries. Among other things, they identified them by their smell. And they actually lived on a few different varieties of hawthorn berries, and they all had a different smell. And none of those smells actually matched the smell of apples. But the different chemicals that made up the smell of their hawthorn, some of those chemicals did match the smell of apples. So when apples started to be planted, even though it was a completely new thing that they'd never encountered before, they already had the ability, they had the networking in their brain to be able to recognize those smells because they were already part of something that they were already utilizing. So the apple was their blue banana. But what about this? What is this? Now, this is a very odd-looking object. So what do you do with it? What would you do with it? Would you eat it? Would you sit on it? Would you run away from it, maybe? This object, although it contains components that we recognize, we recognize things like this pineapple and this pepper, and parts of a chair, this pineapple pepper chair is a very bizarre thing that we don't quite know what to do with. And sadly, we are creating a lot of pineapple pepper chairs for our fellow animals. We are changing our world in ways that they are not able to always deal with. We are creating new objects, buildings, cell phone towers, things that never existed in nature before. We're also introducing a lot of exotic plants and exotic animals that they have never encountered. And furthermore, we're changing the environment that they already live in. We're removing species, or changing or moving around species. For some animals, they'll be encountering blue bananas, things that they can adapt for. But for other animals, they'll suddenly be surrounded by those pineapple pepper chairs. And if they can't adapt and be able to recognize those as something that they can use to survive, well, then they simply won't exist anymore. So insects, like all animals, are pretty remarkable. They have a remarkable ability to identify objects in their environment under lots of different conditions, different climates, rain or shine, high up in the Himalayas or right here in Bangalore. And they actually have such a remarkable capacity for identifying objects that we have not yet created a computer system that can replicate this object identification. And they do it with brains half a millimeter in size. So the next time that a fly lands on your dinner plate, or a mosquito lands on your arm, before, before you swat them away, I hope you stop for a minute and think how remarkable it actually is that of all the things in the world, they identified you as the object of their affection. Thank you very much.